from Atlanta. We are so excited to bring you our registration webinar because that means that you get to register for your classes beginning tomorrow, August 12th. It's hard to believe that this day is here. I know that a lot of you have been doing a lot of work over the summer. Um, you've talked to your pre-registration advisors. You've gone through your Emory Essentials. Um, you have been putting all those classes in your shopping carts and you are ready to go. So we have been compiling a list of questions that you've asked your pre-registration advisors all summer and we've put together just a, a lot of kind of discussion points that we know might still be on your mind um, before you register tomorrow and Tuesday. So we'll go through that. Um, we have five advisors online with us along with producer Blaze. So Anil, Alice, Aileen, Frank, Kim, Thank you so much for joining us. They will be answering your questions along the way. I can also see your questions um, and will do my best to kind of track them along the way or let you know that we will get to that topic in just a bit. So let's get started uh, with our topics. All right, so today we're going to cover a lot of different things um, in this order. So we're going to talk about your registration appointment start times. Hopefully you all have those written down and remember that they're in Eastern Standard Time. Um, but if not, we'll walk you through that. We're going to talk about your class searches in the shopping cart, um, how to use the Opus Guides. There are a lot of really great materials online that will help you with screenshots register over the next few days. Uh, strategies for the first day of registration, which is tomorrow, and then strategies for Tuesday through Friday. Uh, we'll talk about the wait list, my favorite topic, uh, AP and IB credits, the protocol for closed classes, what you can do about that, um, what permissions numbers are and who you need to talk to if you run into that problem, prerequisites, the general education requirements, graded versus pass-fail or satisfactory unsatisfactory, my f second favorite topic, having a balanced schedule, and then finally looking ahead. So lots to cover today, and we're going to jump in and get started. So first off, your registration appointment start times. All of you should have already written these down. Um, your pre-registration advisor should have walked you through. But if you want to double check your start times or you weren't really able to get that written down over the summer, um, you can log into Opus right now, opus.emory.edu, and click on the class enrollment tile. Um, from there, you'll see on the left navigation, there are enrollment appointment dates, and you'll have an August 12th and August 13th start times. So the reason we have unique start times for all of you is so that we don't crash Opus. We need to be nice to Opus because it's going to allow you to register. Um, but do not panic if your time is a little bit later on day one than somebody else's. So we have staggered starts, they are minutes apart. Um, and if you have a little bit of a later start time, so maybe a 9.30 or 9.45 on Monday, you're going to have a little bit of an earlier start time on Tuesday and vice versa. If you have maybe an 8.30, 8.45 on Monday, you'll have a little bit of a later start time on Tuesday. So make sure that you've written down your specific start times. Um, and I recommend that you log into Opus just a few minutes before your start time begins. Um, and you will see in real time which classes are open, um, which ones of the ones that you really wanted to do on that first day that you should get going. So that is what we can say about the registration start times. Now, the end times uh, are the same for everybody. So on Monday, tomorrow, everybody closes out at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So there's nothing more you can do after Monday. And then Tuesday's appointments actually open all the way through Friday at 3 p.m. So you have four days to play around with your schedules. Next, we're going to talk about class searches and the shopping cart. So hopefully you've become really familiar with the Course Atlas. Our wonderful Course Atlas gets you, lets you search for classes by lots of different criteria. Um, so you can search by the department, you can search by the um, the general education requirement, you can either filter by a, a time. So let's go through a few of these. Anything that looks interesting in a course atlas should go into your shopping cart. So if it's something that you think you might want to take this fall, go ahead and put it in your shopping cart. Uh, there are no limits to how many classes you can put in your shopping cart, so don't let that be a deterrent. You're only going to be um, adding courses from the Atlanta campus, though. So if it says OXF or if a department has OXF, that is for our Oxford campus. And since you're all starting here in Atlanta, you want to make sure you're only using the Atlanta campus um, for your searches. You can always go to a department a website if you need more information or details about majors or minors or any of those programs. 
Um, and so again, the course atlas is just giving you information about a specific course that semester. It's not going to give you all that information about majors and minors, which can be found on those websites. And then also, if you haven't already done so and you need to review any of the track advising PowerPoints, we have those for pre-business, uh, pre-health, pre-nursing, pre-dual degree, and pre-law. So make sure you check those out just to hear all the great information from the experts in those areas. Opus Guides, um, our Office of the Registrar has put together a lot of great materials that will help you navigate Opus. Um, so the Opus Guides, the website is posted now, um, so you can bookmark that as well. But they have screenshots and in some cases some short videos that will help you um, navigate the actual how to enroll. Um, you really want to make sure that you are enrolling in courses from your shopping cart. So there's an actual Opus guide that says enroll from your shopping cart. And you can go through the few steps to do that. Um, you will have to validate at one point before you enroll in a class. That just makes sure that you do not have any conflicts on your schedule. Um, so when you click validate and it gives you the green light to go ahead, then you can move on to enroll. But the actual picking classes from your shopping cart and enrolling will take you a matter of minutes. It's a really fast process in real time. Um, and you want to make sure that you've looked over those Opus guides just so you see what to click through. Um, but you guys will be experts at this in just a few minutes. So if you want to go ahead um, and look at that Opus guide too, um, or if you want to log into your uh, planning enrollment tile, course planning and enrollment tile. You actually can't enroll in classes now because enrollment's not open until tomorrow. But um, you would select the shopping cart and then from there, um, beginning when your enrollment time's open, you can pick a class and click on enroll. Um, so once you click on enroll, uh, it'll say, are you sure you want to enroll in this class? You'll say yes. Um, and then finish the process. You always want to double check your schedule to make sure that that course is there. We're going to talk about the waitlist in a little bit, but remember adding yourself to a waitlist does not count as enrolling in an actual class. So for enrollment, you're really looking for open courses um, that you can enroll in. That means that they have spots available for you to click enroll. All right, so a few strategies. Uh, tomorrow, which is day one of registration, August 12th, you can enroll in up to eight credit hours. Eight credit hours is the very, very max. So what you want to be thinking about are what are those two classes or maybe two classes in a lab um, that you are really, really hopeful to get in. I know we've said this multiple times, there's no such thing as a perfect schedule, but there might be one or two classes that you're really, really looking forward to the most or hoping to prioritize or build the rest of your schedule around. So if that's maybe your first year seminar, if that's a course with a specific lab time, that's what you want to prioritize. And you'll get to see what is open in real time, and so you'll pick those classes to enroll. Um, again, eight credits is about two courses, but it could be two courses in a lab or two courses in a health or a PACE. Um, so totally up to you about which those two will be. Starting on day two, on Tuesday, you'll then get to enroll in the rest of your credits as a max of 19, so no more than 19. Um, and you'll also be able to use the drop and the swap function at this time. So on day one, it's really hard to swap. Um, it's, it's a glitchy system, so if you're not in the exact class that you want, leave it until day two. But on day two, this is where you can use the swap function. So you said, nope, I actually want this anthropology class instead of that sociology class. You can swap those from your shopping cart, which is pretty fast. Um, you will not be able to drop below 12 credit hours. So if you're dropping a class and not picking up another one, you need to make sure that you always maintain those 12 credit hours um, or else you'll receive an error message from Opus. So the good news is that Opus will tell you if you are doing something wrong because it won't let you do it. Um, and if that is the case, then you can just go into the swap function instead of the drop function. So the waitlist, um, we've had lots of conversations over the summer about how to use the waitlist. So a waitlist just means that courses are closed, meaning that the seats are filled at the current time, and that Opus is gonna generate a list of students who would like to get in that class if spots open up, meaning somebody else drops, or if the department decides to add a few seats. We really are gonna recommend that you wait to add yourself to a waitlist. Um, the reason why is because the waitlist 
um, is just a computer program and it's looking to make sure that your schedule is free without any conflicts. And conflicts can happen because you're already enrolled in a class at that same time or a conflict could happen because you already have the max number of credits and you can't swap. So um, you want to wait until you have a pretty good basic schedule down and then if there is a class that you'd like to add yourself to the waitlist and you're already enrolled in something else, you'll pick that drop if, which is really a swap function or swap if, um, and so that you're telling Opus, if this class becomes available, I'd like to enroll in this over something that I'm already in. Um, if you add yourself to a waitlist before you've created a conflict, um, it won't give you that option to do the drop if. So um, that's why we're telling you to wait for the waitlist. Another kind of point about the waitlist is that um, you should be monitoring how many waitlists you're on. Because sometimes when you add yourself to so many waitlists, you're, you're basically negating the system. Opus doesn't know what to prioritize you in and when. And so if you're no longer interested in a class or you feel happy with your schedule, please remove yourself from those waitlists um, so we have accurate counts for people who really still want those classes. All right, so many of you are bringing in credits from different sources. The most common are your AP or IB credits. Um, and for anybody who had a question about what counts for AP or IB, we have a chart that tells you all of the scores. And so for APs, it's typically a four or a five, but every department makes their own rules for what we accept. And for IBs, it's the higher levels and typically a five, a six, or a seven. But again, the departments pick what those scores will be. So there should never be a question of whether or not you're going to get the credits because those are predetermined by the departments. Whether or not your scores have posted depends on when you submitted them to the Office of Admission. So many of you have done this already, good job, or you're just waiting for your scores to post. Um, you will get an email once your scores do post that let you know which scores posted. Um, and if you need to make any changes to that, um, there are forms that you can use as well. So while you technically have until December 20th to submit any AP, IB, or previous college credits, we really want you to get this done with now. Um, you actually can make changes, either dropping or swapping those credits, all the way up until you have earned 64 credits. You have a long time, but you have to have those credits posted first. So if you do need to swap, let's say you came in with more AP credits than we will give you credit for, um, there's a form which should be showing now. It's also found in the OUE A to Z resources um, that just tells admissions, please swap this credit for that. Um, all of the tests will still appear on your transcript. It's just ones for credits will be there for three credits, um, and ones for placement will show up as zero credits. If you took a college course before coming to Emory, you have a few steps to take. One, you have to have your official transcript sent to the Office of Admission. And then next, you have to mm -hmm. fill out a form that allows admissions to review those transcripts. So it's a two-step process. Once they've done that, they'll post the credits as well. Um, you will not get an email for those because it's not automated. But you can always check any of your previous credits, AP, IB, um, international exams or the previous college credits. In Opus, uh, you'll click on the academic records tile and then under the transfer credit reports, anything that you bring in will show up. If you have questions at all about what's posted, what to do, where to go, you're confused about it, um, admission really does a good job about answering this, so emailing admission.processing at emory.edu. Um, to follow up. So I see some questions here about I sent my scores but they haven't posted yet, what do I do? Please follow up with admission.processing at emory.edu. Um, also keep all of your emails from the College Board or the ones that you've requested from your IB. Those are good records to have um, until your scores get posted. So the other questions that have come up a lot are should I use my AP or IB credits or those previous credits or um, what should I use for credit? What should I use for just placement? Or do I retake a class? So as you all know, or you should know by now, you're limited to only uh, bringing in 18 credits outside of Emory. And of those, only 12 can come from an exam. So an AP, an IB, or an international exam. If you have more than those 12 eligible credits, they will still get put onto your transcript, but just for zero credits. And so those can be used for placement. Um, or it's also just a nice advising tool for advisors to kind of say, great, we know where you're starting for. 
Um, if you're planning to use any of your AP, IB, or previous college credits for a general education requirement, you need to have them posted for credit. So for all of you who want to place out of that first year writing, that AP or IB English Lang or Lit exam needs to go in for credits, that's for sure. Um, if you're hoping to use a class for maybe a major prerequisite or other things, you want that for credit. If it's just something that you, you know that you're going to take more classes and you just want it for placement, that's how you can choose um, what to do. But like I said, you have until 64 credit hours to make those choices of what you want for credit versus placement. So if you have more questions once you come to campus, um, there are lots of advisors and faculty who can help you out with that. So protocol for closed courses. Um, by the time you register, some classes are going to be closed. Um, as you may or may not know, our sophomores, juniors, and seniors have already registered, so a lot of classes were filled by their seats. Um, and then other things are going to fill first year seminars and writings pretty quickly as you all start to register. So if there is a class that is not waitlisted but is closed and you're interested in it, you may absolutely email the professor and politely ask them what their protocol is for either keeping their own list, waitlist, um, whether or not they can overload into a class, um, and they might just say, please come to my class during the first week and get the syllabus and talk to me there. So every professor has their own rules for um, what they're going to do with a closed class. Many of them will use that automatic waitlist in Opus. So if that's the case, that's the best that you can do. Um, but we do recommend that attending that class during the first week of classes and talking to the professor face to face is often really good too. Um, many of our faculty are still on summer break for the next week or so, and so if you're emailing faculty in the next few days and don't hear back immediately, um, it's not that they don't love you, but they might not be checking their emails as regularly as they will be during the semester. So again, there's no rush for this. Um, you'll be able to reach out to faculty once you're here on campus. Um, you'll also be able to talk to a lot of faculty during orientation, and so if you have follow-up questions, that would be great. Um, so professors, this is a question about overloads for first year seminars. First year seminars are capped at the most at 18. So if a class already has 18 seats filled, then professors are not allowed to overload um, for any reason. That's the rule of the first year seminar. If a seminar was capped at a smaller, like maybe 12 or 13, then the professor does have the right to overload as long as it doesn't get over 18. So that's a good question about closed courses. Permission numbers. Um, some of our classes actually are permission number only, and so that's something that a department or a faculty member will set because they want a little bit of information from you before allowing you to enroll in the class. If a course says it requires a permission number, um, it's similar to you're reaching out for a closed class, you'll send that professor an email and ask them what the criteria are for getting a permission number. So again, be polite. Um, ask what you need to do, um, and then you will follow their lead. So if they end up giving you a permission number, um, it's something that you can enter while you're registering for that class. Um, you'll need that in order to register for a permission-only course. Um, a question just came up about language placement. Um, so language placement, the faculty members who are scoring those tests may or may not be doing that in real time. And so if you don't have your language placement yet, you'll just have to wait until those get scored to add into a language. So um, that's the best advice we can give. There are so many different languages. There's not the same process for each of them. Um, if you've yet to take a language placement because you weren't thinking about it or you know weren't sure about the language, you can still take them. But every department's going to have their own rules. Um, for the scoring and kind of their turnaround getting that to you. So prerequisites. Um, prerequisites just mean that you have to take one course before enrolling in the next level course. So a good example would be Math 112 or Calculus 2. The prerequisite is Math 111. So you cannot register for Math 112 until you've completed Math 111. So we have a number of courses that will have prerequisites. They're usually noted in the course atlas. Um, and also, if you are trying to register for something and you don't have the prerequisite, OPUS will tell you. Um, this, I know for many of you who have submitted your AP or IB scores um, and you're hoping to get into a higher level, if they're not posted, 
Um, at this point, you can email your advisor, your pre-registration advisor, and if you have proof of your score, we can do a temporary override um, if the course is open. But really, we want those prerequisites posted. So um, if you haven't gotten your score submitted yet, this is another good reason to get those in. The other neat thing is that even if you have scores posted for zero credit, Opus will still read that as a prerequisite. So um, a little bit different than counting for a general education requirement, um, as long as those exam scores are on the transcript, even if they're not for credit, they will still count for placement for prerequisites. All right, so the first year writing requirement, we're moving into the GERs right now, um, is one of the four things that all first year students have to complete in their first year. Many of you will come in with either AP, IB, or previous credits for this. So if you do, I mentioned this before, you want to make sure that those credits are posted and that they're posted for credit. So meaning that you have three credit hours for that. Um, it will automatically update your degree tracker to say that you've completed that general education requirement. And so um, if it's not there right now, but you know that those scores are coming, it is okay. You do not have to sign up for first year writing. For the rest of you, and it's about half the class, you're going to take your first year writing either in the fall or the spring. So if it works out with your schedule this fall with English 101 or 181, fantastic, you can enroll. If not, it doesn't work with your schedule or it's just closed at this point, you will take it in the spring. That will be absolutely okay. For the first year seminars, a few traffic rules for this. Um, we know that the seminars are all really interesting, but they're small classes. So first and foremost, you're only allowed to register for one first year seminar. Even though we told you you could put five, six, however many in your shopping cart, you're only going to register for one. Um, again, if you don't have a seminar for the fall, you couldn't get in, or there wasn't a topic that was really calling your name, that's absolutely okay. You'll take one in the spring. There will be a whole new um, list of topics in the spring. So these do not repeat typically from fall to spring, but a whole new group of them will come up. These do fill up quickly. So if you're thinking about prioritizing your day one, if there's a seminar that you really, really, really are interested in, um, and it happens to be open on day one when you're registering, we would recommend that you register for that seminar. Again, if you don't get it this fall, do not panic. You will take one in the spring. So there have been a lot of questions about the Area 7, HAL versus HAP, so our Humanities, Arts, and Language versus our Humanities, Arts, and Performance. So I'm going to try to explain this to you, um, first by sharing that we do have a language requirement here at Emory, so that means that you need to take two semesters of the same foreign language that is not your native language, um, and that the second semester has to be at a higher level than the first semester. So um, whether you're coming in with an AP credit, you still need to get placed into a higher level, that will be higher than that credit posted. If you're starting from scratch, it's just two semesters in that language. Um, after you've completed the HAL, many of our languages also count for a HAP, but at a certain level. So let's say you're going to take Spanish 101 and 102, um, and then you really like it and you want to continue with 201 and 202. Because those are at the 200 levels, those will eventually count as HAPs. Um, but you have to complete the HAL first, and then those additional language courses can roll over and count for HAPs if they're at the 200 level or higher. So um, that should clear up the HAL versus HAP. Um, again, if you're interested in majoring in a language or minoring in a language, we do recommend you getting started um, this year. Uh, if this is something that you're, you just know you don't have time in your schedule this fall, that's okay. You can definitely start in your second year or even your third year. We don't want you waiting until senior year because this is a two semester requirement, but there are lots of opportunities to complete the languages if you didn't get to it this fall. So some other questions have come up about the continued writing courses and when you should actually take these. So hopefully you all know now that you'll have to take three continued writing courses over your entire time here at Emory. First steps first is you got to complete your first year writing. So if you haven't, if you're not bringing in credits for first year writing, you want to get that FWRT done first. Um, but if you have, you are absolutely eligible to take a continued writing in this year. Um, we might suggest you wait until spring semester because these are writing intensive courses, but if you love writing and if there's a CWRT that's really, really interesting to you, you could take one in the fall semester if you already had that FWRT credit. 
We will um, ask you to really stay in that 200 level range and you probably will want to reach out to the professor just to make sure you don't need any previous knowledge or content or courses um, before taking that CWRT. So you can always reach out to faculty and asking if it's appropriate for a first year student to take. Um, but our recommendation is really taking continued writing courses in areas that you're interested in, on topics that you're interested in, because you're going to be spending a whole semester writing about it. So this is not just picking anything from the list, it's really picking things that speak to you. So we haven't talked a lot about this in the pre-registration advising meetings, but you will have the opportunity to take some classes um, pass-fail, or what we call satisfactory, unsatisfactory. Most of the courses you're going to take will be for a grade. Um, and so, especially in this first semester, you're not really sure what's going to count. For a major or minor, you might not know what that is. And so, we always want you to, to take graded courses for things that are counting for a general education requirement, a major, or a minor. Um, if there is a class that is truly just for exploration and fun, um, and you know that it's never going to be a major or minor, you could select to take that pass-fail or SU. Um, you can take a total of 20 credits pass fail in your entire time at Emory. And so um, most of our students usually wait until their junior or senior year to play around with that after they're a little bit more established. Um, a few things are automatically graded or pass fail. So for example, Health 100 is taken for a letter grade. You don't even get to choose that. And Pace 101 is taken SU, so you don't get to choose those. Um, for the rest, too, everything defaults is graded. And so if you wanted to take something pass fail, you'd actually have to manually make that change. And we can walk you through that when you come to campus if you, if you can't figure that out in Opus. All right, so talking about balanced schedules, this has come up a lot. We know we've talked about this in the general education uh, in the pre-registration advising meetings. So at minimum, you have to take 12 credit hours, and at maximum, you can take 19. But that does not mean that you have to go to the max, right? You are all going to be new to college, new to Emory, new to Atlanta. There's a lot of transition going on, um, and we want to make sure that you're starting off on the right foot. So the sweet spot really is going to be somewhere between 15 and 17 credit hours. And the reason why we have this as a range is because, as you've seen now, um, some of our courses are one credit, like Health and Pace. Some of them are two credits, like a lab. Some of them are three, four, and all the way up to five credits. And so we give you that range um, because there are different credits associated with courses. 15 to 17 is somewhere between four and five academic courses, and that includes health and pace. So you can go accordingly. Um, but other things to think about with a balanced schedule is that you're balancing when you're taking your classes throughout the week, so not everything on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, you're balancing the times throughout the day. Um, maybe you want to start a, a few in the morning and then have a break and one or two in the afternoon. Um, or if you like to get things all done early in the morning, that's great, or a little bit later in the day, that's fine. You know your own schedules best. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting balanced across the departments in the general education requirements. So if you're really interested in math, I, you are not taking five math classes, right? Or if you're really interested in history, you're not taking five history classes. You're probably taking one, maybe two in that area of interest, and then you're going to diversify or balance out your schedule with some other courses. And then you also have other things going on, right? You're, many of you are going to have jobs. We have a lot of athletes on campus. Um, we're hoping that you're all going to get involved in student organizations. Those are going to take time, too. Um, and so when you're thinking about those credits and those 15 to 17, while you're only in class about that many hours a week, um, you're probably going to double, if not triple, the amount of time of work that you're going to do for those classes. So about three hours of work out of class for every one hour in class. And then you still have to eat, rest, have some fun, all that other stuff. So we promise you 15 to 17 is totally okay. Um, and if you feel like that was a breeze in your first semester, you can max out later on in, in future semesters. Another quick question has come up about um, the time to get from class to class. Um, we do have built-in 10-minute breaks between our classes, and our campus is really walkable, um, and so I think it is okay to have like a 9 to 9.50 and then a 10 to 10.50. You should have plenty of time to get across campus for those. Um, a question that's come up a little bit more recently, because we know that the bookstore has been sending out some reminder messages, is buying your books, buying them now, buying them later, maybe renting them. So you have a lot of options for books. 
Um, I typically might suggest waiting unless there was a class that you absolutely know you're going to take. So for any of you taking chemistry or biology and you just know that you're going to take that this fall, I think it's okay to order your book and get that ready to go. But for the rest of them, you might want to get the syllabus first. Um, sometimes professors put books on their lists that are required versus suggested, um, and that will be up to you if suggested is really something you want to purchase. Um, you might end up going to the class on the first day going, mm, and I'm not really sure about this. And so um, our bookstore does give a window to return books. I think it's one or two weeks after the semester begins. You have time to do that. Um, but you'll also have time to buy your books when you're here on campus. So really up to you whether you want to buy now or later. Um, there are a lot of other options too. Renting has become really popular. So if you know that it's not something that you want to keep forever, that's fine. Or buying used books is a possibility as well. Um, and so you have more flexibility if you wait to see what all those options are when you come to campus. All right, so after this week, again, the 12th through the 16th are just your first and second enrollment um, appointment times. We've said this so many times, registration is a process, not an event. And so at Friday at 3 p.m., you're done. You're done until you come to campus. Um, but when you come for orientation, we've actually built in a third enrollment appointment time, Monday the 26th through Tuesday the 27th. The reason we built this time in for you is because you'll have already then talked to lots of faculty either at the orientation expo, at the academic showcase, you've gone to a department session, or you talked to your faculty advisor. And so if there are changes that you'd like to make after having those conversations, we give the whole first year class a whole day to themselves to make them before ad drop swap opens. On the first day of classes, which is on August 28th, um, Ad Drop Swap opens for all of our students. So that's you all, class of 2023, all the way through our seniors. And so this is the real fun time where people are making changes to their schedules in real time. Um, and I guarantee that every single person is going to make at least one change to their schedule. So this is where you can keep track in your shopping cart of those classes that look open. Um, if you see a spot that's open in real time, you can snag it, you can do the swap, um, but you can make as many changes as you want throughout that week. And that really gives you a week to try things out, to talk to more faculty, to talk to resident advisors or other students about what looks good to you. Um, and then for spring and the rest of your time at Emory, remember all of these registration things, um, you're registering, you're going to end up registering for seven more semesters after this first one. So if it doesn't work out exactly perfectly in your first semester, because it doesn't, it just doesn't work that way, um, remember spring semester is just a few months away and you have your entire Emory career to um, work on your general education requirements. So lots and lots of time there. This is really just the beginning. So these were our big topics um, for our presentation. I'm going to kind of scan through and let Blaze kind of scour through our questions too to see if we need to go back to anything, highlight anything more. I, I see our advisors are doing um, a lot of great answering of questions too, and Blaze is very excited. We love producer Blaze. He keeps us all straight here. Um, so if there are other questions that you guys have, if we need to go back to another slide or show anything else, we're happy to do that. Um, and I'm just going to re-read. Re, oh, say it with me, Frank. There's no such thing as a perfect schedule. I love it. Thank you. Those are our mantras there, too. So and if Frank, Aileen, Kim, Anil, or Alice, if you have things that you want to clarify or shout out as well, um, you can shout those out too. <laughs> Anil, don't catch feelings for a schedule. Very funny. You'll get to meet all of these advisors too. So we're going to have lots of drop in advising when you guys come to campus and you can talk to them in real life, which is so fun because we've been Zooming with you all all summer. So some really good tips coming in. Make your schedule work for your lifestyle, right? If you hated getting up at 5 in the morning, like I do, um, to get to that 6 a.m. class, don't sign up for a 6 a.m. class. That's the nice thing about the flexibility of picking your own schedule. 
Um, and then uh, this is a reminder for the first day, um, because you're only registering for the eight credits, really you can't really make changes on day one. It's something with our system that doesn't allow the swaps and the drops. So if you've made a mistake, it's not the end of the world. You can start making changes to your schedule on Tuesday when you start registering. I loved 8 a.m. classes, by the way. So I, I get it. If you're not a morning person, sometimes you don't have an option if it's that class you really, really like. Sometimes it's nice to get a class done out of the, out of the way. Um, but you guys are, you also need to sleep. So this is another just good tip in life in college. Sleep should be a priority. Um, you're all going to be really tired through orientation because it's so exciting and fun. Mm. Um, so building your schedule around a little bit of sleep. If you want to build in nap times, that's great too. Um, all of your residence halls are really close. You're on main campus, so there might be a, a chance to even go back to a dorm um, to, to catch a quick nap. So I see we're talking a little bit about the four first year requirements again. Um, for all of you, the only thing you have to do this, this time is register for health and pace. Um, I would recommend waiting to do that until after you have your academic schedules. Um, so remember, one section of health, one section of pace, um, any sections that work for your schedule are great. We do have nine sections of PACE that are permission number only. And so um, if you run into one of those, don't worry about it. Just pick another section. We have some questions about the SNTs. That was one of the general education requirements that I did not go over. So our science, nature, and technology. You do have to take two SNT courses, one of which, at least one of which, has to have a lab component with it. Um, so that would be something like biology 120 with lab or chemistry 150 with lab. So in order to get that lab component, there's usually a lecture and a lab that go together. Um, if you want to take two lab sciences, so all my pre-healthers out there, you're going to get this done real, real quickly. Um, that's absolutely okay too. Um, you do want to be careful for your non-science majors, picking a lab science that's not um, one of the requirements for the science majors is important. So talk to your orientation leaders and your resident advisors when you come to campus. Um, if that's not something you get in your first semester, that's absolutely okay too. So some questions about the logistics of actually registering. Um, when it is your specific time that you can start registering and you go into your shopping cart, the enroll button will appear. Yes, that is the question I think that um, some people showed. So it's not showing right now because enrolling is not an option, but in real time, once it is your time to enroll, that enroll button will appear. If you are not planning to take Chemistry 150 this fall, you are 100% sure you are not going to take it, then you do not have to take the Emory Chemistry Prep. But if there is any slight chance you might add this to your schedule, we recommend that you go ahead and finish the Emory Chemistry Prep, not by September 4th, but really before orientation, um, just so that it's out of the way. So up to you, but um, if there's any inkling that you're going to take Chemistry 150 this fall, please, please, please take that. Emory Chemistry Prep now. All right, good questions coming through. Love all this energy and interactiveness. You class of 2023 years have been amazing all summer long, so please keep it all up. Um, I think there is a question about whether you can start validating your courses now. I think you can validate, but it's not really doing anything for you because it's going to validate everything in your shopping cart. So there's nothing you need to validate right now. Um, validating is something that you'll really do when you're enrolling, just to make sure that there's no conflicts there. So some questions, more questions about the Emory Chemistry Prep. Um, we do not know how long it takes because it depends on your knowledge of chemistry. So these are modules that you go through at your own pace. Some students uh, finish it relatively quickly, and then depending on your chemistry, it might take you a little bit longer. So that's why we encourage you to do it now, because we don't know how long it will take. And thanks. Whoever's writing that, you took the words right out of my mouth, so we appreciate that. All right, so classes like 142 with biology or chem are not showing up in Opus. Um, that's because those are spring courses. So biology 142 is only offered in the spring. Chemistry 202, um, unless you're taking 202Z, should be a spring class. So 
Um, if you are starting off with biology or chemistry, that would be biology 141, and chemistry would be chemistry 150, unless you have a 405 on the AP, and that could be chemistry 202Z. Um, another question about the difference between enrolling and validating. Validating is just clicking to make sure you have no conflicts on your schedule. Enrolling is what actually puts it on your schedule. So enrolling is what you are aiming to do. Validating just checks to make sure there are no conflicts. Um, there's another question about are there any suggested pre-classes? Um, I don't know what the pre is for, so no. Um, really, it's the exploration is the, what we want you to do. At the 100 and 200 level, exploring by those general education requirements, exploring uh, different departments, maybe something you've never heard of before. Um, those are really great ways to get started. And you cannot mess up. We promise, 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 because if something needs to change between now and September 4th, you're going to have opportunities to talk to people and make those changes. So um, that's all you need. There's a quick question about a math assessment. There is no math placement or assessment. Um, unless you're a STEM Pathways student, um, that's a, a few of you might have done a summer module, but for the masses here, there is no math assessment or placement. Yes, this is another really good point. I'm not sure which advisor is doing this, but you do not have to declare a major really to your second year, and no first year student has declared any major yet. So do not worry what you put on your application or what you told us in your profile. We are not making any decisions based on that for you. It was just gathering information to get an idea of where you wanted to get started. Um, and we have seen this in the past few years that 70% of you are gonna change your mind in one way or another by November. So keep an open mind. It's gonna make it a lot more fun throughout this whole registration process. Questions about what tends to fill up the fastest? I would say small classes fill up the fastest, so seminars for sure, the first year writing for sure. Um, and then some of the intros, there will be plenty of spots for biology and chemistry. Um, so if you want one of those, don't worry. You might not get the time that you want, but there will be a space no matter what. Um, other intro classes like sociology, psychology, econ, and math 111, those might fill up a little bit quickly too, but remember they're offered every semester, so if you don't get one of those intro courses in the fall, you can take it in the spring. Um, and other things that might fill up relatively quickly are the intro language classes. Um, definitely Spanish 101, that's going to go real, real fast. Um, so that would be my recommendation for that. Again, you get to pick what you're registering for first tomorrow, so it's your first two classes that you want the most. You do not have to use PACE and Health tomorrow or register for them tomorrow unless you have space and you want to. Um, we typically recommend adding PACE and Health after you've picked your other academic courses because it can fit around your schedule. But if you want to sign up for a section and then swap it later, that's absolutely okay too. Um, but this is the decision you get to make. This is your first kind of big decision of how you're going to prioritize which two classes you're going to sign up for tomorrow. Oh, my screen just went blank. Well, I can't see questions anymore. Um, oh, you'll get to see producer Blaze. Hi. No, he's just going to sign me back in. So advisors, you're doing great. Keep doing your work. I was, I was idle. Thanks, Blaze. Blaze is great, just like orientation. You'll get to meet him, too. Okay. <laughs> Um, so the question is, if you enroll in a class and you decide that you no longer want it, can you drop it later? Absolutely. Starting Tuesday, you can drop it all the way through September 4th. So again, you cannot mess up on this. You have so many opportunities to make changes. Um, you are all going to do really, really, really great. The question is if there are any other GERs you recommend. We don't recommend specific classes because it's all really depending on what you're interested in. So we would suggest searching by the categories 100 and 200 levels. Maybe if you have a specific time slot, you could filter by that that you're trying to fill. Um, and then you can definitely talk to a lot of students once you come to campus. So in your residence halls, you'll have a resident advisor and a sophomore advisor who have all been in your shoes before. In orientation, you'll have an orientation leader. These are great people to ask about their favorite classes, um, a surprise class they took, something that they just, you know, would recommend anybody to take. 
So all GERs are good. All classes, really, you're taking are good because you need credits eventually to graduate. So nothing, literally nothing is a waste of time. Even if you end up picking a class that wasn't your favorite or, or wasn't what you expected, you're giving yourself information about other areas that you might want to explore. So really, there is no wrong thing you can do during this first semester and first um, registration. Uh, a question's come up about splitting the F7 and the FWRT. Um, I, that's a nice way to do it if you can, if it works for your schedule, because they're small classes, so that might guarantee that you have one small class in the fall and one in the spring. But if you can get into both this fall, great. If you have to wait and take both in the spring, that's fine too. So there is not one way that we recommend it. It really just depends on what's open and what you are registering for as a whole. All right, our questions are winding down. We have a few more minutes that we'll go through. Emory Advisors, you're amazing again. Anil, Alice, Aileen, Frank, and Kim, thank you, thank you, thank you for spending your Sunday with us. We couldn't do this work without all of you. Um, and class of 2023, you guys have been so amazing. Um, we, we just got one more question about a 200 level class. Yes, those are okay. If you're nervous about any class and whether you're prepared, you can always talk to the professor first day of class or send an email just asking um, if it's an appropriate level for you. So do not hesitate to do that if you're worried. But if something looks interesting to you, yeah, we want you taking those classes. Aw, thanks Emory Advisors. Cute emojis. <laughs> okay. I think I'm going to sign off on the camera for a few minutes, but if you have a few more questions, you guys can keep keep posting those questions. Um, and again, we are just so thrilled that orientation is now less than two weeks away. We cannot wait to welcome you to campus. Um, we have really good feeling about this class of 2023, so so excited for all of you. Registration is going to be great. Um, we're also, I'll, I'll put, do a plug for this, we're having another webinar tomorrow at 3.30. So after registration day one closes, if things didn't go right, if you have more questions, if you want to talk about prioritizing day two, we will be here. We will talk to you again. We have no planned agenda. It's just answering questions live tomorrow at 3.30. So one last thing is if things come up um, tomorrow or any time during this week, uh, we will recommend you reaching out to your pre-registration advisor by email. That's usually the fastest way. Um, we are still doing a lot of presentations and training and getting ready for you, so we might not always be at our phones to talk in real time, but sending an email will do our best to respond to you within the day so that you have those answers. So yeah, your pre-registration advisor is great. Um, if you didn't talk to a pre-registration advisor, that's okay too. You still have one. Um, so you should have gotten an invitation from them and you can always reach out to them as well um, to ask any of your questions. All right, again, for permission numbers, you would have to talk to a faculty member, so you would email that faculty member. There are not a lot of classes with permission numbers, so you guys do not need to worry about that, but if you do run into something that has a permission number, you just email that faculty. All right, I'm actually gonna sign off now. So thanks to everybody, thanks producer Blaze. He's been an amazing behind the scenes guru. We couldn't do this work without him too. Um, again, have a great Sunday. We look forward to seeing all the great things you register for tomorrow and we are here for you all week and we will talk to you soon. Bye.